Hello guys, this is what if Naruto was the yellow flash of Kiri. Please check out my Discord channel for talking and recommending new fanfiction. Also check out my previous channel Shadow Kage where I posted loads of fanfiction which many videos are completed. Anyways, let's begin with the story. Tarumi Mei literally stormed out of the Hokage's office. She was angry, no she was downright furious. She had traveled to Kanoha to seek money, weapons or even soldiers for the upcoming civil war she was going to lead. It hadn't gone as she had planned. Flashback Mei was waiting patiently in the waiting room when she heard the voice of the Hokage's secretary call her. Tarumi Mei, the Hokage will see you now. The static voice called over the loudspeaker. Mei grinned as she walked into the office of the village's leader. She turned to see an old man in his fifties or sixties. She recognized this man instantly. He was the professor, the proclaimed god of shinobi. He was not a man to be taken lightly due to his old age. Hello Hokage-sama. The chipper women bowed. The Hokage looked to see a young woman with long auburn red hair. She had some of it held with a blue ribbon at the top of her head while a long bang completely covered her right eye. She also had on a long dark blue dress with fishnet under it. She had light green eyes and the Hokage couldn't help but spare a passing glance at her generous assets. She looked to be in her early or mid-twenties. Hello, Mei Tarumi, is it? Mei nodded eagerly in response. I understand you have come on important business? The aged leader questioned, earning him another eager nod. Do tell. Mei cleared her throat, ready to begin her explanation. Well you see, it has come to my, along with many others, attention that our Mizukage, Yagura, is being controlled by another individual. The Genjutu seems to be unbreakable and the only way out is to start a civil war. I have grouped together a large part of Kiri, lead by myself, Jojuro of the Seven Swordsmen and A.O., one of my loyal friends and also a hunter Neen. The dual bloodline girl explained as she inwardly frowned. She had also hoped that her longtime friend, Momochi Zabuza, would help her lead the army as well. He had been too impatient and attempted an assassination attempt on the Mizukage as soon as Ao verified that he was under a Jinjutsu. He was followed soon by Kisame, who had also tried to overthrow the government. We were hoping Kanoha could supply us with weapons, men, money, or other supplies. We will also be changing the certain traits that give us the name Bloody Mist Dot. Sarutobi nodded and rubbed his chin in thought. He took a long puff of his pipe. I see, while I do believe what you are doing is right. Sarutobi started, causing Mei to nod her head anxiously. However I cannot supply you with anything at the time. Kanoha is currently dealing with its own problems regarding the QB attack. Sarutobi sighed at the shocked expression of the young lady in front of him. I'm really sorry, and if it had been any other time. The old Hokage started only to be interrupted. I understand Hokage-sama. I shouldn't waste any more of your time. May practically spat out as she stormed out of the room, slamming the door behind her. Flashback end. This brought Mei to where she currently was, walking down the road thinking over what course of action to take next. This is going to be more difficult than I thought, with Raiga, Zabuza, and Kisame all gone that only leaves Chojuro left as anti-Yagura swordsman. Stupid Kanoha, now this is going to be so much more complicated. The auburn-haired woman looked up to see a small blonde-haired boy enter into a shop. She didn't know why she was looking but all she knew is she couldn't look away. She focused chakra to her ears so she could hear what was happening. Naruto walked up to the counter, hoping to buy himself a meal with the money he had saved up from the Hokage's monthly allowance while he was at the orphanage. He looked up to the old woman who was sitting at the counter. Could I please buy two loaves of bread and a gallon of milk? The young blonde asked wearily. He had a white shirt on with an orange spiral on the back. He also had on a blue pair of shorts. The feature that intrigued me the most was the three whisker-like marks adorning each side of his face. Sure that will be. The old woman started before she looked down to see who it was. She immediately frowned and glared at the young boy. Oh, what the hell are you doing here? 
Get out of my shop, you filthy vermin. She then proceeded to chase the young boy, who couldn't be more than five, out of the store with her broom. May let out a low growl at this. She then appeared in front of the woman in a swirl of water. If I may ask why would you deny a customer, a young boy no less, food he was willing to pay for? The green-eyed woman asked as she picked up the much older lady by her shirt. The older woman gasped for air. He's a filthy demon, that's why. She responded with venom in her voice. What could a sweet little boy like that do that is demonic? May asked as she raised a single eyebrow. Unfortunately we are not allowed to speak of that sweet little boy's deeds. The old woman gasped out as May dropped her on her butt and took off after the young blonde. Naruto was walking down the street with his head down. That had been the third shop today he had been denied from. He had even had enough money. He angrily kicked a rock off the ground as he continued to mop around. Maybe living away from the orphanage would be worse than he originally thought. Naruto, unfortunately, was not watching where he was going and accidentally smashed into a humanoid figure. He immediately scurried to his feet to see a very beautiful lady standing there. I'm sorry. I guess I wasn't watching where I was going. Naruto sheepishly rubbed the back of his head as he mentally prepared himself for some sort of punishment. To his immense surprise, the woman merely smiled. Don't worry about it. I couldn't help but see that you weren't allowed to buy from that store back there. Why is that? May questioned curiously. Naruto looked downcast at this. I don't know. They never let me get anything from any of those stores, that was like my fifth today. Naruto whined loudly. This caused the unknown lady to frown. Why don't you tell your parents about this? She inquired. Naruto seemed to look even sadder at the mention of this. Well, I don't have any parents. Don't you live at an orphanage then? May asked. Well I did, but they kicked me out so I've been living on my own for the last week. I think I'm going to ask Ajisan for an apartment or something. Dot. The young boy responded. May's eyes widened tremendously at this. Don't you have any family at all? Nope. But Ajisan is kinda like a grandpa to me. Naruto responded with a wide smile. Who is the Ajisan you keep talking about? Why doesn't he take you in? May got down on her knees and looked the young boy in the eyes. Well he is really busy and stuff. He is like the village leader I guess. Naruto responded carelessly. May was now thoroughly shocked. The Hokage had taken a liking for a measly orphan. But one day, I'm gonna be a ninja too, and then everyone will start respecting me. Naruto cheered as he pumped a fist in the air. Do you know how to gather chakra? May looked to the frowning young boy. He shook his head no. Well how about I show you, I'm sorry I didn't catch your name. My name is Uzumaki Naruto. Who are you? Naruto asked excitedly. My name is Terumi Mei. It is nice to meet you Naruto. She then flashed him a caring smile. To gather chakra you have to close your eyes and look deep inside yourself. You need to keep searching until you feel a little spark. You then must pull at the spark until it floods through your entire body. It is easier to start in a ram seal. May explained as she showed Naruto how to make a ram seal. Naruto nodded and put his hands in the seal and closed his eyes in concentration. May then waited and waited and waited and waited until she was about to give up. All of a sudden chakra seemed to explode out of the young boy. It seemed to swirl around him in a protective manner. Impossible, he has nearly genin level reserves and he isn't even in the academy yet, it also seems he has trouble controlling his chakra. May carefully studied Naruto's chakra output. Did I do good? Naruto asked. Yes Naruto you did very well. I didn't expect you to have near this much chakra. May explained, causing Naruto to smile at the praise. Sweet. So I'm gonna be a good ninja? Naruto asked. With lots of practice you could be. 
Mei responded, causing Naruto to jump up and down in excitement before he settled down and asked Mei a question. Are you a ninja? Yes I am. I am not from Kanoha, however. I am a ninja from Kirigakure. Kirigakure no Sato is a large village in a small island country known as Water Country. Mei explained. She would admit that in the hour or so she had known the kid he had really started to grow on her. She knew he would make a fine ninja someday. She all of a sudden had a brilliant idea. So Naruto, how do you like it here? She asked seemingly out of nowhere. Naruto hesitated before answering, well no one is really nice to me but the Hokage and I don't have a place to live or much to eat. But Aji-san said that someday I can grow to be a super strong ninja here. Naruto finished with glee. So how would you like to come with me to Kiri? You won't have to worry about living alone anymore and no one will be mean to you for no reason. Also I can train you so you can be a super strong ninja there. Mei explained. Naruto went wide-eyed at this. To actually live with someone who didn't hate you for once, to not have to dig through the trash to get food, to not have to see all the cold glares every day, it would be nice. He then remembered the smiling face of his grandfather figure. He seemed lost in thought for a few moments. I'll do it. But can we tell Aji-san first? I'm sorry, but we can't tell him otherwise he might stop you from going. You don't have to come with. May trailed off at the end. No, I want to. Naruto replied firmly as he grinned broadly at the bloodline limit-wielding woman. Do you have anything you want to bring? May asked, only for the young blonde to shake his head. Then let's go. May stood up and made a couple hand seals. She then whispered something to herself. Naruto all of a sudden looked like a small brown-haired, brown-eyed boy who was dressed well. What happened? Naruto panicked, looking around wildly. Don't worry, it's just a genjutsu. I can deactivate it whenever I want. The older woman reassured the young Jinchuriki as he nodded and they got up and left. She was stopped at the main gate by the Chunin guards. Halt! State your business for leaving. The Chunin asked. My son and I were visiting my sister who lives in Kanoha. We are now heading back to our home, which is located in the Land of Water. May lied. The guard nodded, obviously believing May's lie, and motioned for the two to leave. After they were a couple miles away from the village May deactivated the genjutsu as she scooped Naruto up and took off at a sprint towards her agreed meeting spot. So Naruto, tell me about yourself. May asked as they were running through the woods. Meeting spot. Ao and Chojuro sat huddled around a fire as May jumped down from the trees. Ao seemed to be insulting the underconfident swordsman, as usual. They both turned to see the magma slash boil user with a young blonde kid in her arms. Ao raised his only exposed eyebrow. Who is the kid? He asked. Chojuro then looked over. Um, did you pick him up in Kanoha? He asked. Indeed I did. He seems to have an almost genin level reserve and is only about six years old. He also is not well liked in his home village so I decided to bring him along. May explained. Her two companions merely shrugged. They knew when May Terumi was set on something it was going to happen, one way or another. How did the, um, meeting with the Hokage go? The shy, clearly younger, man asked. May growled. Not well, it appears we will not have the backup of Kanoha. Apparently they are still recovering from the QB attack six years ago. May explained, causing her two companions to growl as well. Fucking bastard. Ao spit out as he unconsciously activated his Byakugan. He glanced over at the young boy to see he did indeed have very large reserves for such a young kid. He saw a small red light and tried to focus in further. He then noticed there was a small amount of this red chakra floating in Naruto's chakra network. Most of it was built up in his abdomen. May. The Huntinine asked. Yes? May answered. Are you aware that this young boy has a second source of chakra inside of him? 
It seems not only thicker but more potent than normal chakra as well. Ao explained, gaining the attention of Chojuro as well. Is that possible? May asked. Ao just looked at her like she was stupid. Actually, it reminds of Yagura. The chakra is much brighter and red in color, though. Ao went on. Chojuro widened his eyes at this. What did you say his birthday was? The young swordsman asked wearily. Oh, October 10 th. May gulped. And what day was the QB attack on? Ao finished. October 10 th. That's why the boy's chakra seems so familiar. He's just like Yagura. They are both Jinchuriki. May answered, lightly stroking the sleeping boy's head. This young boy contains the QB no Kitsune. May finished as she visibly paled. No, this is good. Now we have our own Jinchuriki to even the score with Yagura. Ao exclaimed and Chojuro looked happy as well. You don't get it. Kanoha is going to come looking for such an important person. May reasoned, sounding worried. Well, what are we going to do about that? The seasoned hunter Nien asked rhetorically. They are not going to find him. From here on out, Uzumaki Naruto is no more dead. He is now Turumi Naruto. May stated in a completely serious manner. Um, May, I don't think that is a good idea. The Mizukich and whoever is controlling him is bound to look into someone you adopted. Chojuro offered. True. That is why I am going to say I found him in a small town in northern water country. I'm going to say he was abandoned as a young child. I've kept the fact that I have a bloodline secret long enough. How hard could this one be? May asked with a small smile on her face. She was completely confident in everything right now. She didn't even worry about anything, not the Kanoha hunters, not the Mr. Volt coming up, not even parenting the young boy she had now adopted in everything but paper. Right then and there the young boy in question's eyes flooded open. He yawned. Morning. He mumbled out towards May. Good morning, Naruto. I'd like you to meet two friends of mine. She pointed at a man wearing a classic Kiri Hunter uniform. He also had short hair and large earrings with an eye patch over his right eye. This is Ao. Ao nodded at the young boy. And this, she pointed at a young man wearing a long striped shirt with the Kiri symbol used as a sort of badge. He had on sunglasses and earmuffs. He also wore pants that were gray camouflaged. He had a large two-handled sword on his back. Is Chojuro. Said man smiled at Naruto, who in turn smiled back. Naruto, I have a question for you. May mentally prepared herself for the task at hand. Would you like to become a part of my family? Are you saying? Naruto asked, not wanting to be wrong. Yes, I would like to adopt you. May explained, feeling as if a large weight was lifted off her shoulders. Naruto just sat there for a moment, absorbing the shock. Yesterday he was a lonely orphan who didn't seem to belong, and today he would finally get a family. He responded with a quick nod. May smiled at this. I hope someday I can be like the mom you never had. The red-haired woman said to Naruto as he drifted off into a dreamless sleep, repeating the word mom over and over in his head. The next day... Naruto awoke to the smell of fish assaulting his small nostrils. His mouth drooled at the smell of actual food. The young blonde soon found himself sitting beside the man with the weird eye patch, Ao. He seemed to be starting a fire. He turned when Naruto arrived and merely nodded at the young boy. Where is everyone else? Naruto questioned loudly. May went to get supplies from a nearby town and Chojuro is trying to catch us some breakfast. Ao answered. They should be back soon. Sure enough, within 15 minutes May arrived back at the camp. She didn't seem to have any supplies though. Where's the stuff you bought? Naruto asked, confused. May chuckled at this. I put it all in here. She answered as she took out a small scroll. This is a ceiling scroll. You use these to store items and with no extra weight added on. Naruto's eyes widened at this. Sweet. Will I be able to do that? May nodded. 
Just then Chojuro arrived with five fish on a stick. He started to cook it wordlessly. When it was done he gave one to each of his travel companions. Naruto started to dig into his food like he hadn't eaten well in weeks. He probably hasn't. May concluded sorrowfully. When everyone was ready for breakfast and the fire was smothered Naruto decided to speak up. How far is the mist village? He asked. Chojuro answered this in his usual shy voice, um, Kiri is about a week's travel at a steady pace. I will create a water clone to carry you. Naruto then nodded as the water clone picked him up. It turned out his idea of a steady pace was a lot different than the Kiri needs, because soon enough the three ninja and one clone took off with blinding speed into the trees. After enough ninja training you will be able to move at these speeds as well. May answered Naruto's unasked question. Naruto nodded and was again captured by the sights of all the trees blurring by. One week later, Naruto was completely lost. They had been traveling through mist for what seemed like days. Mist, mist, mist and oh yeah, more mist. Are we almost there? Naruto whined for the seemingly hundredth time. Yes. May muttered impatiently. She by now knew the way to Kiri like the back of her hand, even through the thick mist. The mist had its ups and its downs. It was a bitch to travel through, but it kept foreigners away quite well. Soon enough the mist seemed to clear to reveal an enormous city. Naruto thought it looked so much different than Kanoha. The city was made mostly of cylindrical buildings, looking very odd to the blonde-haired boy. There seemed to be one very large, very odd building in the middle of the city. It had the emblem for water on it just as the Hokage Tower had the emblem for fire. Naruto also noticed there were several large mountains in the back. Welcome to Kiri, Naruto. May smiled brightly at the young boy, who smiled back. May, Chojuro, and Ao were all thinking different thoughts. May's were along the lines of how am I going to take care of a kid. Ao's were about something about the hunter division. Chojuro was thinking about overthrowing the Mizukage and changing Kiri. They all had agreed to oversee the young boy on his training and to help him grow up. He would make a damn fine ninja with his reserves and the fact that he contained the strongest of the nine biju. Kanoha A frantic dog-masked Umbu burst through the Hokage's door, startling the old Hokage. Dog, what is the meaning of this? Saratobi muttered menacingly. He had just gotten to the good part in his Aika Aika paradise. Sir, Uzumaki Naruto has gone missing. Dog sputtered out, causing Saratobi to drop his pipe in shock. Are you sure? Did you check the orphanage? Ichiruka's ramen stand? The Hokage's monument? The silver-haired Umbu nodded to each and every suggestion, having already checked there. How could this happen? Saratobi muttered as he rubbed his temples. When did this happen? The last time anyone has seen him was one week ago today, sir. The aging Hokage sighed. Kakashi, please take off your mask. He ordered. Kakashi complied, revealing a standard Kanoha headband covering his left eye. He had gray, gravity-defying hair and dark black eyes. He had a black mask covering the bottom of his face and neck. Hokage-sama, I'm worried. What if something happened to him? What if someone killed him? Nothing like that happened. If someone had killed him, the villagers would be celebrating. Also, you know as well as I do, no one dares to touch him with the penalty I have made. This leaves two options. He was kidnapped, or he left on his own free will. Saratobi stated, not knowing which option he would have preferred. On one hand, the only people who would kidnap him would be someone who knew about the QB, or someone who knew about his parentage. Both were well-kept secrets. On the other hand, if Naruto had left on his own free will, Hiruzen would have known he had failed the young boy. Minato, have I really failed this badly? You would be ashamed of the way this village treats your son, the Sandame thought. Create a team consisting of any Umbu or Jonin you know who are not against the boy. Find out where he went, summon Pakin if you need to. You will return Naruto by the end of the week. 
the proclaimed god of shinobi ordered with all his authority, intent on righting his wrong. Hi. Kakashi bowed as he replaced his mask and disappeared in a classic leaf body flicker. Saratobi then started out a letter. He would need his students' help for this. After all, Jiraiya did have one of the best spy networks in the elemental countries. Front gate, 20 minutes later. Kakashi stood in front of a small group of Umbu and Jonin. He looked at his group. The first member was a newly promoted Jonin named Tenzo. He had an artificially planted version of the show Dames would release. The second person was his longtime rival, Mado Guy, also a Jonin. The next person was the leader of the Aburim clan, Shibi. The last member of the makeshift squad was a Jonin named Saratobi Asuma. Kakashi nodded to each member and summoned Pakin, his neem dog. Can you track a scent, Pakin? Kakashi asked. Sure, do you have anything I can smell? Kakashi handed the little pug a small strip of clothing off of Naruto's shirt. Pakin nodded and pointed towards the direction he was headed. All right, team, move out. Kakashi ordered as Pakin took off, followed closely by the group of elite ninja. Minato-sensei, I won't let your legacy escape us. The team of elite Jonin and Umbu were traveling through the trees at breakneck speeds. They had to move fast. Their targets were at least a week's worth of distance ahead of them. It seems Naruto and the girl he was traveling with camped here. They also met up with two other people, definitely male from the smell. Packin confirmed as he sniffed the campsite. Thank you, Packin. Which way did they go? Kakashi asked his favorite summon. The dog took lead again as the team began to travel at full speed again. After a couple more hours of straight running, Kakashi began to slow, before coming to an abrupt stop. What is the problem, Kakashi-senpai? Tenzo asked. This, this is the border with Wave. Wave has a close partnership with Water Country. If we continue to travel, we will risk potentially starting a war with Kiri, something we definitely do not need. Kakashi growled as he pounded his fist against a tree. He was beyond furious. Damn it! Why is it that I can never protect anyone? Kakashi asked as he rubbed his pounding fist. He looked at the large dent he had made in the tree and frowned. It's okay, Kakashi. Asuma tried to comfort the pist of Kapinin, but to no avail. No. You don't understand just who that child is. Kakashi glared at the chain-smoking Saratobi. You mean because he houses the QB? Shibi Aburim asked in his ever-monotone voice, not giving away which way he felt on the subject. No, it's because. Kakashi started only to stop, not wanting to give away the top-secret information. Never mind, forget I ever said anything. Mission failure, return back to Kanoha. Kakashi stated as the team of confused ninja took off at a much slower pace towards the village. Kiri. The three Miss Nien and their companion arrived at the front gate of Kiri shortly. Halt! State your names and business in Kirigakure. The guard demanded. My name is Terumi Mei, Jonin of Kiri. Mei paused and pointed at Chojuro. This is Chojuro, member of the Seven Swordsmen, and this is Ao, an elite member of the Huntinine Squad. Mei answered as she pointed at the eye patch wearing ninja. The rest of Kiri assumed he had just lost an eye, only she, Chojuro, and a few others knew what really lay beneath that eye patch. And the kid? The guard motioned towards the young blonde suspiciously. This kid has a name. His name is Uzumaki Naruto. He was an abandoned orphan I found in northern water country. I have grown fond of the boy and decided to adopt him. May stated, causing the guard to raise an eyebrow. Northern water, you say? Is he one of the freaks? The guard asked, referring to the bloodline limit wielders. May growled on the inside at the man's prejudice towards bloodlines. No. His family was killed by the recent Kagaya invasion. May made up on the spot. The guard merely nodded and let the three ninja in. Ayo, Chojuro. Go report the mission to the Mizukage while I bring Naruto home. May commanded, causing the two men to grumble but grudgingly take off anyway. The two arrived at May's apartment shortly. This is my home, Naruto. 
I know it isn't much, but what I have is now yours. May smiled at the smiling blonde. A long tear flowed down Naruto's slender face, lacking any fat at all. May wondered if this was from malnourishment or a side effect of being a Jinchuriki. She, however, opted to not worry about it as she tried to soothe Naruto. It's okay, please don't cry. What's wrong? May panicked, hoping she didn't do anything wrong. Naruto sniffed and rubbed his tear away. That's not it, I've never lived with anyone who cared about me before. Naruto admitted, causing May to frown. Well, you won't have to worry about that ever again. The dual bloodline limit wielder announced. Naruto grinned at this. It wasn't a fake smile, but a real, happy smile. Perhaps it was one of the first of Naruto's young life. May looked out her window at the clouds, wondering what the future had in store. Five years later. Narututu. May called out as she chased behind the energetic blonde. He laughed as he ran, paint buckets in hand. May caught him in a matter of seconds, and soon she had him in a mother scolding hold, you know the type. Tell me why you thought it was necessary to write that all over our wall? May rolled her eyes at her son's antics. Written in bold letters was a long phrase. It read, To whom it may concern, this house once belonged to Terumi Mei and Terumi Naruto before they overthrew the Yande Mizukage. By now you will have recognized the names of the Godame and Rokudame Mizukages, possibly future if the former is still in charge. We aren't in the village anyway, so why does it matter? Naruto whined. Naruto and Mei were currently in one of their cabins as Naruto liked to call them. The two went to these cabins with Ao or Chojuro, sometimes both, a few times a year for a prolonged period of time to train Naruto more than they could inside the paranoid Mizukage's village. They used the cover of the fake missions they had sent to the Mizukage's office. That doesn't matter. You ruined a perfectly good wall. The reddish-brown-haired woman growled at her son's destructive behavior. May had not changed much in the last five years. She still wore the same clothes and behaved much the same. However, she was now much wiser and felt a lot older after parenting a growing boy. Naruto, however, had changed phenomenally. No longer was there the malnourished, scared child that he once was. He was now of average height for a ten-year-old, standing at a little over four feet three inches. He wore a blue shirt with the Uzumaki spiral across his back. He wore a pair of dark black, loose, pants as well. The physical changes were the least of his changes. Mei, Chojuro, and Ao had been training him in the shinobi arts as well. It seemed he was a natural at the stuff. He already had a decent, even for a genin, jutsu supply. His jutsu included the hidden mist jutsu, the water clone, the replacement, the transformation, the water bullet, and the water wall. He also had mastered a few other low-level ninjutsu. In the area of taijutsu, Naruto had progressed astoundingly. He was currently learning Mei's personal style, one she hoped to pass down the Terumi line. Chojuro was teaching Naruto how to wield a sword to a basic level and Ao was teaching him how to use Sanban needles. Naruto had also progressed mentally as well. He knew about the Kyubi, his mother had told him when he turned 10. She told him she felt he was ready to learn the information. Truthfully, he wasn't surprised. He had heard the villagers call him things like demon, monster, fox and his birthday was on the 10th of October. That also explained his godly stamina, his amazing chakra reserves, high chunin level as of now, and his whisker marks. He had also learned about his mother's bloodline limits. He was at first surprised, but he thought they were really cool, and truthfully, he was jealous. May then suddenly popped a Cheshire grin. You're repainting the wall. What? Naruto suddenly looked terrified. Don't complain, you ruined it. And the faster you get it done, the quicker we can start your new, advanced training. May smiled, confident she had a hook, line, and sinker. Naruto immediately saluted his adopted mother and created a large group of water clones to do the work with him. After repainting the wall, Do you think you are ready for your advanced training? May asked, already knowing the answer. Yes. 
Naruto cheered as he pumped his fist in the air. May nodded and Chojuro walked out of the house. How long has Chojuro and Aisan been here? Naruto asked as he looked questionably at his big brother figure. I asked him to come for a special reason, Chojuro, if you will. May looked expectedly at the swordsman. Um, as you know, some of the seven swordsmen, like myself and Kisame, have special swords. These swords were the weapons of the first seven who were chosen to be the swordsmen. Chojuro explained. Well, the other five legendary swords were taken from their owners in battle. They are all gone. The shy man explained. Naruto wasn't sure where he was going with this, but let him continue regardless. We have found the location of another one of the swords. It is buried in a cave in northern water country. We are going to get it for you. Chojuro finished. What kind of ability does it have? Naruto yelled excitedly. The blades are different for every user. They change depending on your chakra type, blood type, and soul type. Chojuro explained in his lecture mode. Naruto nodded, wide-eyed. The journey will take about five days. You and Chojuro will travel alone. May butted into the conversation. Why aren't you coming? The ten-year-old boy asked. I have some other business to take care of. Was all May said as she hugged her son and said goodbye. He returned the hug and soon the duo was on their way. Ao appeared from the shadows. Ao, I have a mission for you. May ordered. What is it? The Byakugan wielder asked. You are to infiltrate Kanoha, and you are to leave with the personal techniques of the Yandame Hokage. May answered, surprising Ao substantially. The Yandame Hokage's techniques? Are you insane? Those are possibly some of the strongest jutsu in the world. If it was within my abilities to steal them, someone else would have already. Ao tried to reason with the clearly insane woman. Yes, but we have something no one else has. May replied smoothly as she threw Ao a layout of the Yandame's personal home and a small vial of red liquid. Whose blood is this? Ao questioned suspiciously. Naruto's. May admitted. You don't mean. Ao's eyes were the size of dinner plates now. I'm not positive, but I believe Naruto is the son of the Yandame Hokage of Kanoha. May answered, confirming the man's suspicions. Ao stared right through his leader, as if asking her to confirm her words. Well, you see, I first assumed this when I saw the Yandame's face on the mountain. I then looked at the young boy and thought, hey, they look alike. I decided to look into it, and when we found out he was the QB's container, it furthered my suspicion. Who better to seal a demon into than your own son? May took a breath, but the part that made me believe so strongly was when I found his name mentioned in a book. This book was the very first book ever written by Jiraiya of the Sanin. It didn't sell very many copies, but the name of the main character was Naruto. I later found out that Jiraiya of the Sanin was the fourth's teacher. I see, so you believe the fourth named his son after his teacher's book? And you want me to use this blood for a blood seal that is almost certainly located on the fourth's personal vault? Ao summed up. May nodded and he sighed. He grudgingly nodded and disappeared into the trees. With Naruto and Chojuro. Are we there yet? Naruto whined loudly as the ninja and ninja-to-be traveled through the mist of water country. No, we still have a ways to go. Chojuro replied, getting angry at the annoying blonde. He had been constantly asking that same question for the last five days. Naruto nodded and waited about ten minutes in silence. Are we there yet? He loudly interrupted the much-needed silence, well in Chojuro's case. No. And stop asking. Chojuro growled, showing unusual amounts of anger. Naruto nodded again, and this time the silence was for about an hour or so. Are we? Naruto started, but was interrupted as he slammed into Chojuro's back. There yet? He finished. Yes. Chojuro replied as he pointed to the cave. It happened to be collapsed with rocks, unfortunately. How are we going to get in? Naruto asked. Chojuro smirked. 
He then unsheathed his two-handled sword and turned it into its hammer form. He slammed the large hammer against the boulders, causing them to clear away. Naruto was in awe of the strength the underconfident man possessed. They continued to walk deep into the cave in silence. Chojuro was getting frustrated. He couldn't find the blade anywhere. Furthermore, he turned to see Naruto walking in his own direction. Wait! Where are you going? Chojuro yelled towards the not responding blonde. He didn't get an answer so he just followed the young boy until they both emerged into a large clearing. In the middle was an enormous blade. It seemed to be six feet long from blade to handle. Naruto was slowly walking towards the blade and reached out to grab it. Chojuro waited to see what was going to happen. Naruto grabbed the blade, and at first nothing happened. He seemed to wield the blade rather effortlessly for it having to weigh as much as him. I thought you said. Naruto began, only to be cut off as a blinding light enveloped him. Chojuro ran forward. Naruto. He yelled as the light cleared away. Standing in front of him was him was the same Naruto he had grown accustomed to in the last few years. There was one change, however. Instead of the enormous six-foot blade, there was one small wakashi and a katana in Naruto's left and right hands. A small breeze of ever-constant wind was swirling around the young boy. Whoa, what happened? Naruto murmured. Looking at the blades, it seemed one was about twice as long as the other. The longer blade had the kanji for wind, while the smaller had the kanji for fire. Chojuro looked with wide eyes. They don't look like much. Chojuro admitted. Naruto nodded. Try to focus chakra into them? Chojuro suggested. Naruto focused chakra into the blade labeled fire and the blade immediately ignited into untamed flame. Naruto dropped the sword in shock. Oh my god. He yelled as he focused chakra into his other blade. The katana then started to glow blue as the wind around Naruto started to swirl uncontrollably around his body. What's happening? Naruto cried out as the wind typhoon swirled around him relentlessly. Rocks and dust was kicking up, but Naruto seemed to be fine. Naruto, the blade is feeding off of your chakra, cut the flow. Chojuro yelled through the howling wind. Naruto stopped the flow and immediately the wind died down to the gentle breeze it was before. Chojuro sighed and walked over to pick up Naruto's new wakashi. He grabbed it by the handle and was surprised as he immediately dropped it. Ouch! Hot! Chojuro yelled as he dropped the sword on the ground. Naruto walked over and steadied the blade. Be careful! Chojuro started, only for the young blonde to pick up the blade and look at him quizzically. It doesn't feel hot to me. Naruto raised an eyebrow at his mentor's shock. Maybe it cooled down when I dropped it. Chojuro reasoned as he went to grab the blade again, only to experience similar results. Hmm, it looks like only you can grab the blade, I'm assuming it is the same with your katana as well. Naruto looked wide-eyed at the two blades that he had sheathed at his sides. All of a sudden a face-splitting grin enveloped Naruto's face. Sweet. The young Jinchuriki chirped. So what do you think I can do with them? He asked, referring to his new swords. I am assuming the Wakashi will give you control over fire through it, and the Katana will do the same with wind. Although you will have to find your own limits and abilities with them. The swordsman finished, causing Naruto to nod. Let's get back to the base in case May needs us. With this the two swordsmen took off towards their makeshift home. Back with May. I know. He is starting to put two and two together, it won't be long until Yagura, and whoever he is being controlled by, finds out about Naruto's tenant. May whispered in a sorrowful voice to a shadowy figure. The shadowy figure nodded in understanding. We must move within the year. We definitely must wait for Ao and Chojuro to get back. The shadowy figure whispered. I know. Get Yurigu and Namiko and tell them that in one year's time, the Mizukage will fall and Mist will return to its rightful place at the top. May commanded and the shadow nodded and disappeared. 
May sighed and started to rub her temples. Being the leader of a rebellion was a lot more work than she had thought. We're home. Naruto yelled as he creaked open the door. He soon walked in and was followed by Chojuro. Mei hugged Naruto and nodded to Chojuro. Did you get the sword? Mei inquired. Naruto nodded and pointed to his waist. Swords. Naruto corrected. Mei looked in shock. Two. What do they do? Well the small one apparently has power over fire, well the longer one can control wind. Naruto answered with unusual seriousness in his voice. Mei smiled and motioned for Naruto to leave the room. What is it? Chojuro asked nervously. The rebellion is going to happen sooner than expected. Mei whispered in a hushed tone. The shy swordsman's eyebrows shot up. How sooner? he asked. In one year's time. Mei answered. Are you kidding? That's a whole four years ahead of the original plan. The sharp-toothed man yelled. I know, Yagura is getting suspicious about our recent activities, especially involving Naruto, I'm afraid that if we wait that long, it will be too late. Mei whispered as she looked down at the ground. I see, where is Ao? Chojuro asked quizzically. He is on a mission. This was all Mei said in return. Chojuro understood that he was not to keep pondering so he changed the subject. What are we going to do about Naruto? Mei frowned at this. It may be harsh to put such a young boy in a battle that will be happening, but I'm afraid we have too, if Yagura sees how strong such a young boy is, along with his Jinchuriki status, he may become hesitant. Mei answered. They both knew hesitance and confidence were as important as power in wars. What do you mean? I know Naruto's strong but he isn't that strong. Chojuro questioned. That is why in the next year, all of my and your free time will be towards training Naruto. You will teach him how to wield his swords in silent killing while I teach him chakra control, other techniques, and taijutsu. We must have him at least chunin level, or higher, by the time of the rebellion. Mei answered. Chojuro nodded in return. Naruto. Mei called upstairs. The young boy yelled, what, in return? Come down here. Mei finished as her son walked down the stairs. Yeah. Naruto asked excitedly. Would you please focus chakra into this card? The older woman asked as she handed Naruto a small rectangular card. It was pure white. Like this. Mei then focused her chakra into a similar card and a third of it crumbled to dust, a third of it burnt and a third of it got wet. Naruto looked confused at this. When you focus chakra into these cards they will show you your elemental affinity. I have earth, fire and water so my card burnt, got wet, and crumbled to dust. If you have wind it will split in half and lightning will crumple up. Mei finished explaining to her young son slash student. He made an O oh with his mouth and then focused his own chakra into the paper. The paper split into thousands of tiny pieces and those pieces then burst into flame. Mei's visible eye widened. Impossible. She trailed off. What is it? Chojuro asked, also confused. A wind user is supposed to split the card in half, but Naruto, he split the card into thousands of tiny pieces, and they caught a flame, meaning he is extremely adapt towards the element wind and he already has a secondary element, fire. Mei finished, leaving her lecture mode. Whoa, sweet. Naruto shouted and pumped his fist into the air. Mei was never more confident about the future than she was right now. Nothing could stop her, her rebellion, her family. Namike's estate. It should be right about, here. The masked form of Ao whispered to himself as he was searching around the Namike's estate. The place wasn't all that big, but it was very complicated. Ao would vouch for that. He wiped a bead of sweat off his eyebrow and skimmed his hand across the wall. The blood seal should be here. Ao whispered as he spread some of Naruto's blood on the seal. At first nothing happened. 
A full minute later the seals on the wall became bright red and the wall slowly opened, revealing a room full of scrolls. I'll be damned, the kid really is the son of the fourth Hokage. Ao whispered in an impressed voice. He searched for the two specific scrolls he was sent to find. Of course, he couldn't steal the scrolls, or risk causing a war with Kanoha. That didn't stop him from copying the contents onto a different scroll. He searched through the library for about ten minutes until he found something. Raisingan, hmm this was one of them. Ao pulled out a blank scroll and used a data transfer jutsu to copy the content of the Raisingan scroll onto his blank one. He then searched again for what seemed like hours until he was about ready to give up. If I were the scroll to the most powerful jutsu on the planet, where would I be? Ao questioned himself dryly. He then decided to take a break so he sat on a chair. The chair collapsed and the leg fell off. Crap. The Kiri hunter frantically picked up the leg and he was surprised to see a scroll fall out. Bingo. The scroll was labeled, Hiration no Jutsu, or the Flying Thunder God. Ao smirked and used his data transfer jutsu again. He then replaced the scroll and body flickered out of the house. Small cave outside river country. So it's true then. A dark figure asked a hazy man with gray eyes. He had a ripple-like pattern in his eyes. Yes. The QB container was spotted walking in northern water country. The man answered. The figure with dual Sharingan eyes widened his eyes. The Sandame had announced Naruto as dead, according to his spy network. And you are sure it is him? He matched the description perfectly. And there is more, he was traveling with a member of the current Seven Swordsmen. Chojuro to be exact. The Rinnegan wielder announced. So he's been living under mist this whole time. That fool, the genjutsu we placed on Yagura hasn't broken, so maybe he has help from outside forces. The Uchiha muttered lowly. What should we do Madara? Do we slip Yagura the information? He asked curiously. We will let Yagura work it out on his own. I have no need for him anyway. Madara ordered, causing the other man to widen his eyes. Are you sure? What if the Jinjutsu breaks, or one of the Jinchuriki kill the other? The man asked wearily. Don't worry pain, I've modified Yagura's seal so if he should die, the Sanbai will be loose on the world once again. From there we can capture it either way. I have confidence the Kyubi won't die. Its healing abilities are too great an obstacle. Madara answered. The other man, now identified as Pain, widened his eyes in shock. I didn't realize you studied seals. He pointed out. The Sanbai's seal is one of the lesser complicated seals. I was also Mizukage, if you remember, so I had lots of time to study the seal. Madara stated in a monotone voice. I trust there is nothing else. Pain asked. Madara merely shook his head and walked away. In Kanoha. Jiraiya stormed into the office of his one-time sensei. If the man was surprised he was here, he didn't show it. What can I do for you Jiraiya-kun? Sarutobi asked cheerily. I have some information you'd like to know. Jiraiya looked dead serious so the Sandame activated his privacy seals. Yes. The old Hokage asked his student. Do you want the bad or the worse? Jiraiya asked, causing Sarutobi to raise his eyebrows. The bad first. Sarutobi concluded. Uzumaki Naruto. Jiraiya started. Sarutobi's breath quickened at this one word. It had so much meaning. Has been spotted in northern water country. He was traveling with a member of the Seven Swordsmen. The Toad Hermit muttered melancholy. So he is in fact a part of Kiri. This complicates things, we can't just go in and grab him, or risk a war with Mist. If we demand him back we would have to state why we want him, we don't even know if they know about his Jinchuriki status, if they did we wouldn't ever get him back. The Sandane concluded, wondering what could be worse than this. And the worse? 
There is a new formed group called Akatsuki. Currently they have 10 members. The only ones I know about are, Orochimaru, Uchiha Itachi, and Hashigaki Kisame. The old sage muttered, downcast at the name of his old friend turned traitor. Their objective is to capture the nine biju. What they will do with them, I don't know. Saratobi's eyes widened to new extents at this realization. This means the rest are probably S-ranked criminals as well, this isn't good. Jiraiya shook his head at this and left in an extremely terrible mood. Back with Ao. Ao hopped up to the window. It was late at night, if the pitch blackness was anything to go by. He opened up the window and slipped inside. He was greeted with a sight he wouldn't soon forget. May walked out, wearing only a wet, tight towel. A small drip of blood slid down Ao's nose. Oh my god! You perverted bastard! May screamed. Ao shook his hands in front of him, hoping to be able to get away from the beating he was likely going to get. No. I swear, I didn't know. He yelled defensively. May seemingly accepted this and walked back into the bathroom. She came back out with her usual attire. They were all business now. Mission status? May questioned. Completed. Naruto is indeed the son of the Yandame Hokage of Kanoha. Ao confirmed the bloodline user's suspicions. Hmm, this is wonderful. When Kiri is under our control, having the heir to the yellow flash would put fear in the hearts of IWA, Kyumo, and even Kanoha. May rubbed her hands in delight. We have to tell Naruto about this. He deserves to know. The hunter Neen reasoned. May sighed. I know, I'll tell him in the morning. With this the two shinobi both went towards their respective bedrooms, intent of getting their eight hours. They were both wondering about the future of their blonde-haired friend, and son in May's case. May sighed as she looked across the table at her adopted son, Naruto. She bit her lip, hard enough to draw blood. The light red-haired woman was very worried at what she was about to say. Naruto, I have something I need to tell you. May trailed off. This gained the attention of both Naruto and Chojuro. Ao, already knowing what May was going to say, just sat back and watched the show. Yeah? Naruto asked as he swallowed his food. May took a deep breath. We discovered who your father is. May admitted. A loud clang was heard as Naruto dropped his fork in shock. Who? Naruto asked, wide-eyed. Your father was a man named Minato Namikaze. He was the Yandame Hokage of Kanoha. May let out in one breath. Naruto's mouth opened in shock, before closing. He sat there, motionless, for a good five minutes. May didn't know what to think. How did you find out? Naruto suddenly asked. I had my suspicions, but we didn't know until Ao infiltrated Kanoha and stole the Yandame's personal jutsu, using your blood to get by the blood seals. May answered her son's question. Naruto nodded, apparently accepting that answer. I see, I guess that makes sense. Why else would he choose me as the contained Naruto started before something dawned on him? I get to learn the Yandame's techniques? Naruto all of a sudden screamed. May chuckled. Yes, but not until you are older. For one, the Hyrushin requires you to have a fully developed body, or else it could affect your growth. You will be able to learn the Raisingan when I deem you ready. For now I have a jutsu for you. It's called the Shadow Clone Jutsu. May then proceeded to explain the concept and benefits of the Shadow Clone. She knew Naruto would take this jutsu like a fish does to water. One year later, Kiri. Naruto stood next to a group of older ninja. There was his mother, Jojuro, Ao, and a few people he had never met before. They were standing on a stage in front of a group of people. They were the rebellion's main forces. There were about 1,800 people in total. His full undivided attention was on his mother, Mei. As you all know, the rebellion will commence as planned in three days' time. Mei announced, causing uproars of cheering. 
these people were ready for the bloody mist to come to an end. This war could take many years, and many of us will lose our lives, but it is for a greater cause. You will all play a role in freeing Kiri from the grasp of Yugura. The cheers doubled at this point. Now I bid you all farewell. You know what you are to do. May ended as the crowd nodded and left to their respective houses. Naruto had trained to the point of exhaustion for the last year. He had basically spent the majority on silent killing, kenjutsu, taijutsu and ninjutsu. He had the skill level of a mid chunin without using the Kyuubi's chakra. He could also control about a tail's worth of chakra without going insane and killing everyone. He had made great progress with his swords. The blonde had even found he could connect the two swords to make one long, double-sided sword. He hadn't practiced focusing chakra into the double-edged sword yet, his teachers advised him to wait until he had a better grasp of combining his elemental chakra. After everyone was gone, Mei and Chajura walked up to Naruto. Naruto, I know you don't like it, but you are most likely going to have to use the Kyuubi's chakra at one point or another. Mei frowned, knowing her son was against using his demon's chakra. Naruto nodded. He knew he was going to have to. He also knew he wouldn't use the fox's chakra unless he really needed to. I know. I will continue to train throughout the war as well so I won't have to depend on it very much. Naruto grinned. May still looked uncertain. What's wrong? Naruto asked his adopted mother. Nothing, it's just, exposing such a young child to a life like this. Many people are going to die, and I just don't think I see could handle it if you died. May was openly sobbing at this point. Naruto embraced the taller women, trying to calm her down. Don't worry mom, I promise I won't die. Believe it. Naruto grinned at his mom, who soon grinned as well. Sorry to interrupt such a touching moment. Chojuro butted in. But what is the plan for us that are currently not camping out in the outskirts? You, Ao, Nakai, Naruto and I are currently the only people in the rebellion that are stationed in Kiri. We will attack the Mizukage directly. I don't plan to kill him right away, but we must distract him as the main force attacks from the West Gate. May explained. Truthfully she and Chojuro would fight the Mizukage, while Naruto, Ao, and Nakai would take on his Umbu guards. Nakai was one of May's trusted advisors. He was a tall man, standing at a little above six feet three inches. He had light brown hair with a small goatee. He had hazel eyes and a long scar running down the side of his face. Nakai served in Kiri's umbu for many years. Please leave, I must make the final preparations for the upcoming war. The bloodline user motioned for her friends and son to leave. They all nodded and disappeared in body flickers. Naruto then went off to start some more training. Woods surrounding Kiri. Naruto stood in the middle of a clearing with a water balloon in his hand. He read in the Rasengan scroll that you needed to focus chakra in two directions at once. He thought it would be easy, boy was he wrong. Gah! Why doesn't this work? Naruto yelled out in frustration as he continued to try and pop the damned balloon. No matter how hard he tried, he just couldn't pop the thing. He decided to look back in the scroll. Naruto searched the scroll many times but couldn't find any hints. No wonder it took the Yandame three years. Naruto yelled to himself. May smiled from in a tree. She was proud of her son's perseverance. Many others would have quit by now. Not Naruto though. He didn't know the meaning of the words too hard. May sighed as Naruto passed out from exhaustion. He was unaware he had been training for a little over five hours. Two days later, Naruto stood to the side of his mother, who was currently addressing the army about their plans. Giving them war talk and such. Naruto was happy he had completed the first step of the Rasengan, although he knew it was an uphill battle from there. He rested his hands on the handles of his two weapons, no partners. Just as Chojuro had said, he had come to a point where the blades were merely extensions of him, limbs of their own. 
Today we'll start a battle which will free the mist from everything that Yagura has done. We will no longer have to fear being killed, no longer will we have to put up with this. This war will take a long time, many will die. But you all knew that before you agreed to join. Now take your places, when you see the signal, attack. The crowd roared in approval and Mei, Naruto, Eo, Chojuro and Nakai made their way to the Mizukage Tower. They arrived and calmly walked into the office of Yugura, who seemed to be filling out papers. Mei, Chojuro, Eo, Nakai, what a pleasant surprise, what can I do for you? Yagura asked innocently, as if he wasn't the reason hundreds have died. As if he wasn't the reason Mist wasn't a place you would want to be. Truthfully, he probably wasn't, it was whoever was controlling him. Who is your young friend? Yagura asked harshly, as his eyes narrowed. May growled. At this sign a group of hidden umbu appeared. It's time that the Mist becomes free again. May yelled as she lunged at the Mizukage, intent at taking off his head. The Umbu went to intercept her, only to be stopped by Ao, Naruto, and Nakai. Your fight is with us. Ao stated motionlessly. He glanced at Naruto, as if inwardly telling him to not get too involved and to play a backseat role in this fight. The Umbu unsheathed their swords. Ao then lifted his eye patch, revealing an implanted Biakugan. The four Umbu gasped. You implanted the eye of a Keki Jenki user? How dare you defile your face with such disgustingness? You will die today. The leader of the group challenged. Ao merely took a stance. Nakai pulled out his dual scimitars and Naruto unsheathed his swords. He had named them Kazieba and Ryukan. May attempted to stab the man with a kunai only for him to block at the last second. You're trying to fight me? We both know you are no match for me. Yagura pointed out. May smirked and formed a set of seals, before spitting out a blob of molten magma at her wide-eyed opponent. A Kekai Genkai? Interesting. The three-tailed Jinshuriki smirked before going back to engage his opponent. West Gate. Two gate guards were standing at the gate. Neither of them was paying much attention as nothing had happened in years. One of the guards looked up when he heard the noise of feet hitting dirt. He saw a group of a thousand or more men and women charging at the gate. His eyes immediately opened wide. Daihi started but was cut off as a kunai planted itself into his neck. His partner looked shocked before the same thing happened to him. The group continued throughout Kiri, killing as many ninja as they could before the village regrouped and pushed them out. They were intending to cause as much damage as possible before that happened. Mizukage's office. What do you hope to gain from this? There are many followers of mine that will continue even if I'm dead. Yagura questioned the girl as he caught her punch and backhanded her back. May growled before shooting another blob of lava at the Mizukage. He dodged it but it burned deep in his desk. That's for me to know and you to wish you knew. May countered as she landed a solid punch on the man's face. Yagura growled and decided to retreat, seeing as he was short on Umbu. Ao and Nakai had each took on two Umbu, while Naruto was backup, only interfering if need be. Ao was handling himself pretty well. He was currently sealing off some chakra points in the right Umbu's chest. He was so preoccupied he didn't notice the other umbu charging in until it was too late. Or so he thought. Decapitating swing. Naruto yelled as he swung his large katana. As soon as he did this, an enormous blade of wind shot out and decapitated the incoming umbu. Ao nodded at the young blonde, who nodded back. Ao finished with a palm strike to his opponent's heart. They turned to see Nakai, electricity searing through him, standing over the two dead bodies of Umbu. All of a sudden a green haze started to form around Yugura. With newfound strength, courtesy of his biju, he swatted Mei away and jumped out the window. Mei growled, but remembered it would never be this easy. This was only the beginning. The group of ninja jumped out of the window, only to be surrounded by about 50 low-level ninja. 
Naruto grinned as he pulled out Ryukan. His blade then ignited into flame, surprising the ninja. He disappeared in a burst of speed and left third-degree burns on three of the surprised opponents. The son of the Yandame could have killed the three, but he didn't want to. They didn't have to kill all of the Kiri Nin, as they needed some for when they took over Kiri. Nakai sent out a pulse of electricity, knocking out a group of ninja. The five took this path and quickly escaped. Split up! I'll go with Ao and Nakai to damage the crops, while Naruto and Chojuro will return to join the main attack force. Mei commanded. The five nodded and split into the two groups. Naruto and Chojuro ran in silence through the mist. They both knew where they were going, both being trained in silent killing. All of a sudden two ninja jumped down and confronted them. One of the men was a man of average height, being 5 feet 11 inches. He had wavy blonde hair and piercing green eyes. He wore a classic gray Kiri Jonin vest and black pants. The other man was of similar build, being about 6 foot even. He had short black hair and dark raven eyes. They shared one thing in common, they both had large zanbatos strapped to their backs. Well, if it isn't my old friends. Chojuro said, trying to hide his uncertainty. Naruto noticed this. Who are they? These two and Hojashi Anusi and Daichue Kuruski. They are members of the Seven Swordsmen of the Mist. Inusi is the fifth seat, and Kuruski is the seventh. Chojuro added. He himself was the fourth seat, while Raiga was the third, Zabuza was the second, and Kisame was the first. Naruto gulped. He knew they were in for a battle. He, Chojuro I've always wanted to show you that I deserve the fourth seat. I guess now you'll just have to die. Inusi growled as he unsheathed his blade. His sword was about five feet long. It had a gray wolf carved into the silver metal and came to a wicked curve. It looked like a very big scimitar. Chojuro glared and unsheathed his own sword, higher Kimi. Kuruski looked at Naruto and unsheathed his sword. It was a normal katana for the most part. The only different was it was pitch black and had a chain attached to it. The other side of the chain was wrapped around his arm. Naruto glared at the older man and unsheathed Kazieba. The wind seemed to pick up and spun around Naruto in a protective manner. Kursuki made the first move as he literally heaved the sword at Naruto, throwing it like a spear. Naruto dodged and the blade stuck into the ground. Kursuki merely yanked on the chain and the blade came sailing back. Naruto swung at the older man and sent a blade of wind at him. Kursuki gasped and dodged. You already know elemental manipulation? He asked in a gruff voice. Not really. Kazieba here has the ability to control wind, like so. Naruto answered as he thrust the blade forward and an enormous gust of wind bulleted at the older man. Caught off guard, Kuruski was sent flying into a pile of dust. He got up and brushed himself off. Nice trick kid, but now it's time to get serious. Naruto didn't even see the man move as he was suddenly in front of him. The man took a swing at Naruto, who in turn brought Kazakiri up to block the blow. Naruto grunted at the power behind the man's swing. If this was the seventh seat, he didn't even want to think about how powerful the first was. The man continued his relentless assault of Kenjutsu. Naruto barely blocked or dodged each swipe. He knew when he was outmatched. Korsuki grinned all of a suddenly. Not bad kid. But I gotta finish this now. With that the man started a set of hand seals. Water style, water dragon jutsu. Korsuki yelled as a large dragon of water materialized out of the nearby lake. It came towards Naruto at alarming speeds. Naruto grinned as a tornado of wind surrounded him, easily absorbing the blow. He called it the wind shield. Not very original of a name, but it was a handy jutsu to have, especially when he didn't need hand seals when he had Kazieba out. The older man growled before charging again. Naruto smirked as Kursuki overextended his arm. 
The blonde Jinchuriki caught the arm and spun the older man around himself counterclockwise. He then attempted to deliver a finishing sword strike, only to find out that it was a water clone. He knew he'd fallen into a trap when two hands extended out of nowhere and locked him in a water prison. I'll admit it, you're good. But not good enough. You made a mistake in thinking that I would overextend my arm in a situation like that. Korsuki grinned as he prepared to finish the young boy in front of him. I guess this is a good time as any, give me some chakra. Naruto mentally yelled as all of a sudden a red haze started to build up in the water prison. It wasn't blood, Korsuki noted. The water started to boil and soon the entire prison fell apart. Korsuki's eyes widened as he saw the man, no thing, in front of him. Naruto's fangs were lengthened to abnormal length. His three whisker marks were even more defined and his hair was much more animalistic. His eyes were also blood red with slits for pupils. Those were the minor changes. He had a cloak, for the lack of a better word, of chakra surrounding his body. The cloak surrounded his head and looked like fox ears, while there was a single billowing tail from behind Naruto. Jijin Shuriki. Korsuki yelped. Naruto then disappeared in a surprising burst of speed and already had Ryukin unsheathed. He would have taken off the man's head if he didn't have an amazing reaction time. The blade then ignited into flame and burned right through Korsuki's own sword. The blade went through Korsuki's sword like a hot knife through butter and proceeded to behead the man. Naruto looked down sadly at the corpse as the red chakra dispersed. He turned to see that Chojuro had already finished off his two opponents, although he had a couple of deep-looking wounds. One in peculiar seemed to be gushing blood fast. It seems the news of your tenant is now out to the entire world, Naruto? Chojuro muttered weakly. Naruto rushed over and frantically picked up the larger man. Chojuro, are you okay? Naruto screamed. He wanted to believe Chojuro would be all right, he really did. Yeah, get me back to the Medneens. I'll be fine. Chojuro tried to sound strong but it was hard with the amount of blood he was losing. Naruto pulled some bandages out of his pouch and tried to wrap his friend's wound. He then lifted him up as carefully as possible and brought him back to camp. Later that day, rebellion camp. They stood smiling in front of the large group again. They had already suffered several losses, but she was proud to note that they hadn't lost as many people as Kiri did. She frowned at the thought of all the lives that were going to be lost. May knew it was for the best. The group was celebrating the victory, no matter how small. May walked into the back room to see Naruto standing over Chojuro. How is he? May asked, hoping for a good answer. The doctor said he was pierced in the stomach, he should make a full recovery. Naruto responded. His voice didn't have any of the usual vigor. That's great news. Is something the matter? May asked with a frown. Yes, how many people are, are going to die? Naruto immediately looked up into the eyes of his adopted mother. May sighed at this. Many people, unfortunately. We just have to remember that this is for the best. They knew all the dangers and wanted to fight regardless. May answered cryptically. Naruto nodded his head. I'm going to train. He tried to get up, only for May to sit him back down. Come on, celebrate with us? May pleaded towards her clearly distressed son. I can't, the stronger I get, the less people will die. Naruto answered with a grin as his body flickered away. May sighed at her son's attitude. He truly was a trainaholic. She hoped once this war ended, he would become the bright ball of joy he always was. One year later, Naruto stood in front of a large group of men. He was now taking part is the hardest mission of his life. Their objective was simple. They were to infiltrate the house of Yudakata and eliminate him. He was one of the strongest ninja currently on the other side. 
Naruto had trained non-stop in his free time and was now a high chunin low jonin level ninja. He was with a group of jonin level ninja. Some wondered why the young boy was on such an important mission. It was not only for his talent but also because he had certain advantages with the QB. They would prove essential against Yudakata. Yudakata is the Jinshuriki of the Rokubi. His biju is a six-tailed slug. He is reported as the second or third strongest man on our enemy's team with his biju. Our mission is to eliminate him. He should be in his home right now. Don't get me wrong, his house is very well guarded. This will be one of the toughest missions we've been on. Nakai, Naruto and I will take care of Yudakata while the rest of you take on his guards. Move out team. Chojuro, the now identified leader, spoke as the team took off into the darkness. They were unaware of how challenging the mission was going to be. Naruto turned to Chojuro and smiled at his best friend. He was confident they would both make it through this. Yudakata's house. Yudakata stood in front of the famed six-tailed slug. He was clearly in his mindscape. Yes? The amber-eyed man asked his lifelong partner. This battle up ahead is not one you can win. The slug explained. This caused Yudakata's eyes to widen. What do you mean? When I go all out with your chakra, I could even defeat you Gurusama. He was clearly confused. I feel the presence getting nearer, run. Run while you still can. The Rokubi seemed to be really distressed. What presence? The brunette Jinshuriki asked questionably. Kyubi, the Kyubi's container is near. Yudakata's eyes snapped open. Can he control the Kyubi's chakra? He asked. You better hope he can't, the Kyubi was a merciless demon. He was deceiving, cunning, and had the power to back it up. When I heard he was sealed I began to fear for the worse. He could affect his container as many ways. Many bad ways. The giant slug explained. What do you suggest I do? Yudakata asked as he took a deep breath. I suggest you challenge him to a duel. A simple one-on-one -on -one fight. He is not but a boy, and without his biju's chakra I hope he won't be too much of a challenge. Yutakata nodded. It seemed like a good idea. I may actually have to use your chakra, I haven't used it since that day. He came back into the real world to see a group of three men standing in front of him. Guards! He yelled, only for nothing to happen. Your guards are currently being handled. Chojuro narrowed his eyes as he unsheathed Hiromakarii. Yutakata narrowed his eyes right back at the younger man. I propose a suggestion. This caught the three's attention. What? Chojuro asked, not trusting the Jinshuriki. A duel between me and the QB vessel will decide our fate. Should I win, I will personally behead him. Should he win, I will join your side. Yudakata explained. Chojuro looked uncertain as he glanced at his friend. Naruto seemed to be out of it. Trip. 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 Naruto was currently staring down the strongest of the biju, the Kyubi no Yuka. This wasn't the first time he had talked to the fox. He did hope that it would be the last, however. What is it you want, Ninjen? The Kyubi growled, clearly annoyed. The Rokubi container just challenged me to a duel. Naruto explained. And? The fox questioned. I may need to use some of your chakra if he starts to use the Rokubi's chakra. Naruto answered. No. The Kyubi simply answered. Naruto was gawked. What do you mean no? He asked frantically. I said, no, use your own power. With that Naruto was sent back into the world of the living. Welcome back. I assume your talk with QB went well? Yudakata asked in a monotone voice. Naruto merely growled. I accept. 
He answered as he withdrew Kazieba. Good. With this Unicata shot a blast of bubbles at the young blonde, Naruto easily dodged them. Naruto. Are you sure you can take him on by yourself? Chojuro asked, trying to get some confidence. No. Naruto answered truthfully. But I'll do it regardless. Decapitating airwaves. Naruto then fired a blast of invisible air blades out of his sword. Yudakata seemed to dance around the blades. This will be easier than I thought. Yudakata mocked. Naruto growled and charged in, trying to gain the upper hand. He tried to punch Yudakata, only for the fellow Jinshuriki to spin around his fist and backhand Naruto. Naruto took a deep breath and effortlessly deflected the incoming fist. He then landed a solid punch on the brown-haired man's face. Yudakata took the punch and tripped Naruto's feet from under him. You're good, but not good enough. Yudakata smiled as he caught the incoming blade in between the palms of his hands. Big mistake. The small wakashi then ignited into flame and burned Yudakata's hands. The brown-eyed Jinshuriki growled as the demonic chakra healed the wound. Naruto growled and sent a flaming bullet straight at the man's head. It was deflected with a simple bubble. You're good. Yutakata admitted. Truthfully, he wasn't going full out. He was easily a high jonin level without his biju's chakra. Part of him didn't want to win the match. Naruto stood across from him, Kazieba in his right hand, Ryukin in his left. He was breathing heavy now. You too. Naruto then charged forward and attempted to stab the older man, only to be roundhouse kicked away. He knew he was outmatched. He also knew he wouldn't give up. The blonde dragged himself off the ground and latched the two blades together. He now had a dual-sided sword. Think the lightsaber of Darth Maul, only one side is smaller than the other and they are swords. Explosive release, flaming blades. Naruto yelled as he focused chakra into the blade, combining the wind and fire chakra. The result was an enormous explosion of wind and fire racing towards Yudakata at high speeds. The jutsu picked up enormous amounts of dust. Chojuro and Nakai were amazed at the sheer power of the jutsu. When the dust cleared it showed a completely unscathed Yudakata. Hmm, that was a very strong jutsu. However it wasn't enough to penetrate my bubble barrier. Naruto grinned at this. Yudakata frowned, seeing the devilish grin on the other Jinshuriki. His eyes widened when another Naruto erupted out of the ground. The Naruto outstretched his palm and Yudakata saw a spiraling sphere of death in his palm. Raisin The Naruto yelled as he plunged the jutsu into the older man's chest. It, however, was deflected by the eerie demon chakra that came out of Yudakata. No more Mr. Nice Guy. Yudakata showed unusual amounts of emotion as his eyes glowed gold. The demonic chakra seemed to form a cloak around him. Naruto could only think one thing as the transformation occurred. Fuck. Guys that is the end. Comment ramen if you got this far and I will see you next time.